Welcome to the House of the Lord's YouTube channel, where you can experience all the dynamic teaching and preaching that happens in the house. Thank you for tuning in, and we pray you are blessed, encouraged, and changed by the word you receive here. because there's none like you in the universe. Thank you that you are an amazing God. And I wanna thank you for keeping us all day long today from dangers we could see, dangers we could not, from the arrows that fly by day and the novel coronavirus that stalks the night. Thank you that you are a protector. You are our deliverer and we say thank you Lord we pray for the world and the situation that we are in maybe somebody will turn to you and say we need thee oh we need thee every hour we need you so thank you for this opportunity open our hearts and minds to a fresh revelation of your word we want to be able to process it in our minds, live it out in our lives. Whatever is accomplished, we'll say yes to your will. In the mighty name of Jesus, we pray and we give thanks. Somebody say praise God. Amen. All right, go ahead and be seated. Glad you're here. Let me just um, give a couple words to the novel coronavirus and then go on. First of all, um, you, you are grown folks. How many grown folks do I have in the house? Ray, wave at me so I know you're grown. Okay. You make your own decision. Um, I've been asked a couple of questions. I ain't shutting down the church, so. But if, if you are, if you are elderly, I don't know what that means, but if you old, I don't know what that means, but I'm 68, but so whatever you is, if you feel like you are the age where you would, might be vulnerable, then don't come. If you have a compromised respiratory system, don't come. You need to make those particular decisions for yourself. Uh, but I think that we are overreacting um, because I think there's, sh I mean, I've read a number of articles and it looks like we're shooting in the dark. We're not sure what's going to happen. We're not sure how. Um, it spread, and you may not be aware of this, to some country, countries, they done shut down the whole country. And it's still spreading. Other places, they didn't shut down nothing, and it didn't spread. So it's hard to say what's going to go on. We don't know the incubation period. We don't know how long to shut down. We don't know any of that stuff. And I already predicted last week um, that uh, our uh, reactions, our paranoia may cause more damage than the disease itself. Um, for those of you who are afraid, I, I'm, I'm not much of an alarmist, but some people are. Um, we're going to try to, I don't know if they can buy no more Perel because they done, yeah, I think they probably sold out. I don't know. I am sold out. <laughs> so if they sold out, I don't know what you're going to do. But um, just, just bump or fist bump or elbow bump if you're scared i mean i'm i'm, I'm not scared but i, I do know that i'm going to be i'm going to be cautious so i i have a tendency to to put my hand in my face a lot so i need to wash my hands and use perel and that kind of stuff but i'm not going to stop shaking hands and whatever because uh, we, we're coming to a, a phase here where we don't touch each other that much to begin with Okay, and uh, y'all, we touching here because y'all the church, that's the house of the Lord. But out on the street, we ain't touching that many people. So uh, I don't know what the issue is going to be except they're going to shut us all down. And to me, uh, forgive me, but, but uh, it's nuts. I mean, they, they're just, they're going to shut. But guess what they ain't shutting down? Money making stuff. 
and they ain't shutting much of that down because we got to make that money. Even if we stop the NBA game, they playing on TV. They gonna we they we gonna make that money. Okay, and so um, I, I just think we need the church right now, if we've ever needed a church before. And let's be realistic too. If we don't have no service, we don't get no money. You know, amens on that. And the money don't come back the next week. So um, you do what you feel you need to do. Basically started out talking about um, uh, groups over 1,000 and then groups over 250. And they just keep coming down. So I guess after a while you won't be able to talk to nobody. We're all going to go in the house and shut in. But I, I, I just don't know how that's going to work. So we'll see. What's going to happen? All right, that's enough of that. Um, we've been, I'm working on this new series, and this is about the fifth message in. We did it for a counterculture club. It was so good. I just said, I can't leave it over there. We need to come back over here and talk about some of this stuff. The ethical demand by Logstruff is real, really heavy philosophical stuff. But I'm going to break it down so that we can get down into it, even though it's going to be kind of heavy tonight. If you have not been here, we have surveyed the eight places that the phrase comes up in the Bible, you shall love your neighbor as yourself. And now we are making application of that from a, from a uh, not only a ethical demand, but from a biblical demand and looking at some of the uh, philosophical uh, perspectives of that demand. So the ethical demand uh, we, we started to talk about is silent because unlike the divine command, which is at least stated in the Bible, there is no entity outside the church to pronounce this demand. So we're going to go down here real deep. So look at your neighbor. Don't touch him. <laughs> Just look at him. Don't touch him. And don't let your eyes stay too long. Lokstrup's teaching is going to seem strange. But by the way, there are some preachers that are not going to be able to preach because they, they, they touch your neighbor every two seconds. Touch your neighbor, touch your neighbor, touch your neighbor, touch your neighbor. Touch your neighbor. After a while, I don't know what they're going to say. Uh, so anyway, Lokstrup's speaking teaching is going to seem strange to us because of the way that American culture has impacted us. So I've got to give some quotes today. I'm not giving them to you in the notes because I don't want to plagiarize uh, Logstrom's book and material, but I think you can get enough out of it for us to make application. First quote, it is a characteristic of human life that we normally encounter another with natural trust. This is true not only in the case of persons who are well acquainted with one another, but also in the case of complete strangers. Only because of some special circumstances do we ever distrust a stranger in advance. End of quote. Under normal circumstances, we accept a stranger's word, and we do not mistrust him or her until they give us reason to do so. Initially, we believe one another's word, Initially, we trust one another, and I'm not talking about a deep relational trust, but a civil trust. Since civility has fallen to an all-time low and the tenor of American relations is contentious at best, we probably believe that our interaction with others is filtered through skepticism. Yet, it would be difficult to maintain any kind of inter interaction with others if we were as skeptical as we think we are. In fact, the basic trust that we normally encounter when we interact with others is seen in the fact that you've got to teach children to distrust others. Children don't come here distrusting. We got to teach them. Now, that's a stranger. Don't trust them. Furthermore, the skepticism and the distrust that seems to attend modern interaction is maladaptive and displays emotional and psychological sickness in the present or in the future. If you are really as skeptical as you think you are, as Americans, as we think we are, we're going to be sick in the long run because we need interaction with other people at a certain level. In short, it is normal to extend initial trust 
to those with whom we interact. So whenever you interact with people, you're extending some kind of initial trust. Otherwise, why are y'all looking at me? Otherwise, you wouldn't talk to them because you would not trust them. Therefore, you would look at them and say, well, I'm not going to speak to you. I'm not going to speak to you because I don't trust that you're going to respond. We're going to go a little deeper. Look at the next powerful quote. To trust, however, is to lay oneself open. That is why we react vehemently when our trust is abused. As we say, even though it may have been only in some inconsequential matter, abused trust is trust that is turned against the person who does the trusting. The embarrassment and the danger to which we are subjected by the abuse is bad enough, but even worse if the fact that our trust was scorned by another person. Let's slow down. Make sure we get this. When we trust somebody, we lay ourselves open to that person. Consequently, when the trust is abused, even though it may be some inconsequential thing, we react with intense emotions and intense convictions. Because ab abused trust is trust that is turned against the one who does the trusting. That's why you act the way you act when you speak to somebody and they don't speak back. When you talk to another person, you're laying yourself open. You're putting some level of trust in the person who's receiving that communication. You're expecting them to say something. There you go. See, some of y'all catching on. If you say, well, how you doing today? You expect them to say something. You don't expect them just to look at you. So you are opening yourself by speaking. And when people do not respond, it is painful. Therefore, we experience embarrassment and danger to our personhood because we start to wonder, we're going to get some questions in a minute, what is going on? If, that, if it isn't bad enough, Lokstra said, that we also experience our trust being scorned by the other person. The other person uh, though little of the, thought little of the fact that we demonstrated a significant level and then didn't answer, that's even worse. You did, I talked to you and you didn't consider me important enough to answer. And so we get that a lot at the church. I'm waiting on an amen. I come in, there are three people standing there. I know one of them. I speak to the one I know. And I don't see the rest of y'all. I don't know what y'all doing. That's painful. I speak, I come in, I'm just speaking to people, but they, act, they don't know me, so they don't speak. That's painful. Communication is always risky. Communication is always dangerous because you do not know how people are going to respond. We think we do because we trust to a certain level, a certain extent, that they're going to respond civilly. You don't have to like me. You don't have to love me. Just say hello. Hello. Okay? Now that's hard for people because I, there's some folks that are in pain, they got other issues, stuff going on, they don't know how to respond. Just say hello. Move on. When you don't respond, you are giving painful messages to people who have trusted you. Now my book on betrayal begins to expose the danger, the malady, the blindness of betraying someone's trust. You said, I didn't, I didn't betray anybody's trust. When they spoke to you, they, when they opened themselves to you and you chose not to respond or to respond flippantly or however you chose to respond, you may be betraying their trust. Consequently, whatever its form, whether articulated or silent, there is an expectation of trust that manifests itself on the presupposition that the other person will fulfill that expectation. This is new stuff. If we don't think about it that way, my speak, don't speak, what's the big deal? The big deal is we're talking about human beings opening themselves up 
I speak to you, I'm opening myself. So he writes, this is to say that by manifesting the expectation, one has already surrendered oneself to the other person, even before it is certain that there will be any fulfillment. I'm still quoting. In other words, the manifestation is necessary for bringing about the fulfillment. Perhaps simply in order to make the other person aware of what we expect from him or her. End of quote. In short, when we talk to another person, we are manifesting an expectation. I expect you what? To answer. To say something. And for many of us in a church like this, we expect more than that. We are expecting a, a, probably a measure of warmth. Right? And for some of us who've been around a long time, we might even be expecting some, uh, I shouldn't say a long time, short time, some love. The new people, I have to try to bring them and, and put them in school because they think everybody at the house of the Lord loves them. You know, this? You know, I, they're, so, they're, they're so excited, you know. I'm so excited to be here among my brothers and sisters. And, you know, I'm just glad to be saved. And, uh, and I got to bring them to the side. Come, come here. Come here. Everybody here don't mean you good. We have the saints and the ain'ts. The, the people who got issues, some saved and the unsaved. We got all kinds now. Let the wheat and the chaff grow together. When I come, I'll do the separating. So we have some expectation, but in that expectation is a latent surrender of ourselves to the other person. Did you get that? This takes place even before it is certain that there's going to be any fulfillment. When you trust the other person for civil interaction, you're opening yourself. And at the same time, you've surrendered yourself in a way because you cannot take back what you've already done. Once you speak, it's over. You can't go back and say, I want to take that back. I didn't mean to speak to you. You can't go back. It's out now. You can't say, hello, oh, I'm sorry. Forget, that. Forget I said hello. Hello. You've, you've opened yourself. You've, you've made yourself vulnerable to a certain extent. And we don't generally think through whether we're going to speak to another person, at least not for cordial communication. The rituals are such that we just speak to everybody. It's just that. Now, we don't do it as much here as we do down south. Up here and in the north, that's why I say I'm not sure we're trying to keep people from getting the coronavirus. They ain't touching no way. They're barely speaking. But they're vulnerable. They're not vulnerable that way. That's church people who are vulnerable. The world is vulnerable through coughing, sneezing, those kind of things. Right here, we're vulnerable because we're shaking hands, touching, face-to-face, -to -face, hugging people. That makes you more vulnerable. But not that much for other folks. And so when we choose to interact in that way, and cordially at least, we assume or unconsciously expect the other person to honor our communication. Or, I know you're not thinking about it, I'm trying to get you to the point, our trust in them. Because if I speak to you, I'm trusting you to respond. So the manifestation of the expectation is necessary for bringing about a fulfillment. I'm not going to get that fulfilled unless I get some kind of expectation. And when I speak to you, I'm, I'm, I'm putting out an expectation. I, I want you to speak back. Okay, so when I say, well, like, what's up? I don't say what's up and walk away. I wait. Because I'm waiting on what? A response. I spoke to you. Now I'm waiting on you. I'm trusting you to respond as you ought to, civilly as you ought to. If you don't, that's a problem. Now I got to figure out how I'm going to deal with that. Being a Christian, uh, should I forgive you? Should I cuss you out? How should I respond to this? 
I'm saying I spoke to you like in a good Christian manner and you didn't respond. It's at that point that we begin to ask moral questions. We begin to wonder about the conduct and the character of the people who are disappointing us. Here's a couple, several questions that we begin to ask in our own mind. What kind of person abuses our trust by not responding appropriately to our communication? Our question is going to be, so what's wrong with you that you can't speak? What's your issue? What's, what, what's going on? Or what kind of person scorns our trust by not responding appropriately to our communication? What kind of person embarrasses us in their response to our communication? Because now I'm embarrassed. I spoke to you. You didn't respond to me. But normally in this community, there are other people around who heard it. So, and they're going to come and say something. You go, well, I don't know why they didn't speak to you. But what you telling me for? You talk to the person who didn't, didn't speak to me. Why don't you talk to them? Why don't you say, that was not right. Bishop just spoke to you and you didn't speak back. You don't come tell me. I'm hurt. Well, Bishop, I don't know why they didn't speak to you. Must be uh, maybe something wrong with them or I don't know. What kind of person exposes me to danger in their response. Now, once again, most of you up until this point, you don't even know it's any danger. I just didn't speak. I didn't feel like speaking. I don't know why I didn't speak, but uh, it's, it's up. I, it's, I can do what I want to do. I ain't got to speak. But you're putting people in danger. You're hurting them. You just come up with the plain old-fashioned question, what's wrong with the person I'm interacting with? Something is wrong. But our disappointing expectations are so painful. Oh, this is so, such good stuff. Bump your neighbor. Don't touch him. Just bump him. Because if you don't bump people, you won't be able to praise God. I can tell how y'all look it. It's tough to praise God by yourself. That's why y'all kind of low because of the novel Corona's no touch. You got to bump them a little bit to get that. Ooh, okay. So now... We come to why that's so, it's so painful that we have to cover it up. Logstrom writes, it must at all costs never become apparent to the other person, and preferably not even to ourselves, that it's a matter of disappointed expectation because though we have been exposed, we are at pain not to admit it. We would much rather admit blemishes and weaknesses, mistakes, and stupidities than to admit having laid ourselves open. End the quote. So, when I speak to you and you don't speak, I act like I didn't speak to you. I said, well, hello, hi. Why? Because it can be so painful I'm not going to admit that that took place. In the NBA, they do this a lot. They, they play all of those uh, tapes where people are left hanging, you know. <laughs> because it is embarrassing and nobody wants to admit it. So rather than saying, hey, man, I'm trying to slap your hand, we go, <laughs> I'm not going to admit that I was disappointed. And so we now come to a blindness that is inherent even in facing our own disappointed trust. We are greatly reticent to admit the pain of disappointed trust. We would rather, he said, admit blemishes, weaknesses, mistakes, stupidity. I'm not going, I don't go around and tell people, well, you know, I spoke to so-and-so and she didn't speak to me. I just act like I didn't speak to you. You don't mean that much to me. That kind of vulnerability is so painful, so dangerous, that we prefer not to even admit it to ourselves. Is that keeping us from experiencing the kind of intimacy that God has created us to experience, that we are afraid to face the fact that we have been disappointed. 
and will unwilling to share it, unwilling to interact in it. I, I'm far different, and that's the reason why I have the issues I have, because I don't mind telling folks that they have disappointed me. That's the only way you can have a relationship. You got to be able to have that kind of communication. Most of us, we want the intimacy, but we're not willing to face the danger. We want the intimacy, but I'm not, I'm, not, I'm not going there. So what you end up doing is not being open enough to experience what it is that God has for you. Maybe this is because we would demean ourselves for trusting someone we shouldn't have trusted. Or maybe it's because it's too much to face the fact that something so fundamental to life has failed and we are left to our own devices. We, we will say that we are stupid. I don't know why I spoke to him anyway. I don't know why I did that anyway. I, I, shouldn't, I should know better. I, I should not. And then we demean ourselves. There's nothing wrong with you if you expect other people to speak to you. There's nothing wrong with you. Something wrong with them. Okay, you can't touch nobody, so just point at them. Something's wrong with you. <laughs> it ain't always something wrong with me. Sometimes it's... And it becomes me because I'm unwilling to face the reality of what just took place. This is serious stuff. And it would change the atmosphere of the church if we could hear it. It will change us because we are, we're down into the philosophy of why things are so painful and why people don't respond and why we, we can't move forward into that relationship. Can I give you another quote? If communication between persons in conflict with each other is cut off, sparks of moral reproach and accusation begin to fly. Because there is self-surrender in all forms of communication. Anytime, I'm, I'm not sure if you're getting it. Anytime anybody speaks in any way, I have opened myself to you some kind of way. Because I'm not sure how you're going to respond. And it may be evil, nasty, good, I don't know. Rejected self-surrender expresses itself in moral accusations because the situation is emotional and plain and because the exposure must at all costs be kept covered up. So I got to deal with sometimes we express moral indignation because I want to cover up my pain. It hurt me. It hurt me that you didn't speak. But I'm going to operate like it didn't hurt me and I'm going to try to cover it up by being angry. Did you get it? I'm not going to say, wow, that really hurt. I'm going to say, well, you know, to you too. <laughs> that covers the hurt. It covers the pain. And then it makes me feel better, even though underneath I still have the issue. I'm still in pain. So we, this isn't new stuff for you, that part of it. You know that, that uh, uh, anger covers pain, covers hurt. And then after that, revenge covers Anger, it begins, those things are covered up. So a lot of times when people are angry, it's because they can't face their pain. So they're going to be angry with you. I'm going to be, rather than deal with what's going on. So the author moves from basic interaction to conflict. Even in conflict, we seek to cover up personal exposure of laying ourselves bare because when communication between persons and conflict is cut off, sparks of moral reproach and accusation begin to fly because of self-surrender. How many of you have ever had an argument? Okay, a few of you. Two of you. If you've ever had an argument and the person who is arguing cuts off, It is painful. Now, I have to teach folks that because they don't know it. Well, I just want to talk no more. Yeah, but, but I do. Okay, so I understand. And normally in a couple situation, after one person has said what they want to say, it's easy to cut off. I done said what I want to say. Now, you, now you're going to listen to what I have to say. 
But I think they're going to cut off. I, I, I've said, I said all I'm going to say. Good. Just sit there and listen then. I got some stuff I want to say. Okay? So we, but, but it gets cut off. How dare you? I'm, re, I'm, I'm in the material right here now. How, how dare you scorn my self-surrender by cutting off the communication? The author says that cutting off communication is a rejection of the self-surrender of the communicator that will precipitate moral accusations because the situation is emotional and plain. And plain. I'm trying to make myself vulnerable to you, and you don't care. And so now I got to keep the exposure covered up. It's so painful. I, I got to attack. Or I got to be angry. I got to somehow cover it up. Because I don't want to so blatantly expose my self-surrender and my vulnerability. And explains again the blindness of biblical betrayal. So it's difficult when you are in those situations and you're trying to work through. And the other person is actually acting like you just don't count. You're not that important to me. And I would say that to people, and I've tried to teach people that, but it's hard. If you don't want to interact with me, there's a certain level of what you're saying. You're not even worth it. Why would I even talk to you about that? You don't matter. I don't, you know. And so when you respond, then you're going to respond with moral indignation. Okay. I, huh, huh, excuse me? Really? And then we're going to go violent. Why? Because I'm trying to deal with my, my, the pain that I'm dealing with and being rejected. You know, you're going to listen to me or, or okay, something getting ready to happen. Or I'm going to hit you or something going to go down. Because I'm in pain and you are not honoring my person. So the basic character of trust it's also revealed in another, bump somebody and say, this is good. Okay, don't bump, look at them. This is good. Here's another way that it comes about. In love and sympathy, there is no impulse to investigate the other person's character. Oh! In other words, this is so deep here, we do not create or construct an image of who the other person is when, the, when we are in love with them. There is no impulse to judge them. When we love them, we're in good standing, everything's going good. I, I, I'm not paying any attention. I'm not, I'm not trying to judge them. If, on the other hand, we are not in sympathy and the other person or there is a certain tension between us and the other, uh, and the other because of something um, about the other regarding which uh, we are uncertain or irritation or dissatisfaction or antipathy or whatever it is, then I form a picture of the other person's character. And I begin to see him or her in a variety of dispositions because now I'm on my guard. When I'm on my guard, I start looking at you saying, calling you names. You nasty so-and-so, you. I'm on guard now. And because I'm on guard, I, I felt that. Y'all related to that, didn't you? And because I'm on guard, now I'm, I'm, I'm making a characterization of who you are and how I see you. If we're on good terms, you can do whatever you want to do. I don't see you that way. I'm just, well, they, they, they didn't mean it. But did you hear what they said? They, they didn't mean it. They just, you just misunderstood. Why? Because we're in love. We're on good, we're on good ground. We're on good. But when we're not on good ground, you just speak. You know, how are you doing? What do you mean by that? We got issues because I am now judging you. I've made a characterization of who you are and you are not good and you don't mean good. Are y'all are listening to me? Therefore, it is not the reality of where they are. It is how you read the situation. And 
behavior and, and civility and all of those things can be very problematic. So there is no judgment of the character of a friend. But when there is tension, irritation, dissatisfaction, we begin to evaluate that character. We're on guard. We become skeptical of the character of others. By the way, I said this enough, but I don't think people really can hear me at certain points because of um, cultural interference. A lot of folks are sick because of this. More and more, they're coming back and they're letting us know we are sick because we ingest this kind of skepticism, this kind of angst, this kind of pain, this kind of, it will make you sick. We learn over time then to guard against being fooled, being tricked, being naive, or any other way of letting trust get the better of us. So some of us have figured it out. I'm just not letting nobody get in. I'm not going to give them much. I'm not going to speak much. I'm not going to, I, I got my guard up. You're not getting past a certain point. That'll make you sick. Some of y'all say, well, I'd rather be sick <laughs> than hurt. No, you don't. Because hurt, you can get over. Hurt, God can deal with. Hurt, you can get forgiveness. Sick becomes set. It becomes a set pattern that will bring pain. I, I'm getting ready to let up and go because I can see I'm, I'm putting so much heavy stuff on y'all. Some of y'all are sinking down. One final quote, and I'll give it up. To associate with or to encounter personally another person always means to be in the power of his or her words and conduct. Psychology refers to this as the power of suggestion. Gerard calls it mimetic rivalry. The dynamic interaction or suggestion or imitation between two people. We are always being impacted and impacting anyone that we interact with. What did I just say? Yeah, I thought you didn't hear me. <laughs> we are always being impacted and always impacting anyone that we interact with. I used to talk about it from the perspective of every time two people or three or four, however many get together, they make a decision. They're impacting one another. The decision may not seem like a decision, but it is a decision because the dynamic interaction is so dynamic that you don't even recognize what you picked up from the other person. And they don't recognize what they picked up from you. Want a quick example? Okay, for the three of y'all who say yes. You go out to dinner after church and say, you know, what do you think about the sermon? Getting ready to make a decision. Getting ready to make a decision. I don't know, because I don't know if I agree with, we get ready to make a decision. We're getting ready to affect one another about what's taking place. And we don't know that we've even done it. And we'll walk away. I don't know if the sermon was good. We've made a decision that it isn't because we, I disagreed with something. Oh, it's tied up in here now. Because every time you interact with anyone, some kind of imitating is going on. You need to get aware of it. Become aware that when you talk to people, when they talk to you, you're sharing something. You're trading something. You're sharing. Now, let me go to one more level, and I can get on up out of here. So, the old folks used to know that because they would talk about it in terms of the spirit that's being passed between people. We don't talk about that anymore. It's just like we got to know certain folks around you will transmit to you certain kinds of stuff. And the next thing you know, you down. And can't figure out how you got down. 
but you just interacted with somebody that the spirit of depression was all over them and it messed around and got on you. I'm trying to make sure that I don't want nobody else's depression. I don't want nobody else's sadness. I don't want. Now, if they got some joy they want to pass to me, thank you. They've got some, some, some compassion, some good stuff they want to buy. But I don't need your mess. I got enough of that. My, and I don't want to transmit that to anybody. I want to transmit healing and joy and peace to people. So if we used to talk about that, you know, you just can't, we don't do that anymore. You can't let everybody put their hands on you. You can't let everybody pray for you. Everybody pray, 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 pray for me. They're going to pray some demons down inside of you. Keep on messing around. Everybody don't be, don't touch me. Don't everybody be touching on me, praying, you know, because I don't know where you've been, um, how many demons you've been dealing with. I mean, you know, I don't know. So let's be careful. That's why you need a pastor and other people you trust and know. Y'all pray for me. People you don't know. Thank you. Can I pray for you? Yes. But don't put your hands on me, though. I don't want any transference. In short, in its basic sense, you didn't know we were going here. You thought we were just going to talk about you know, you should love your neighbor as yourself, and we could keep stay up here like we normally do. We, you didn't know he was coming down here with the real interaction. In short, in its basic sense, trust is essential to every conversation. Every time you interact with anybody, there's some kind of trust going on. We step out of ourselves to enter a speech relationship, which surrenders ourselves to the other. So be careful. What you say to folks, how you hear them, how you respond. We can say that communication is a relationship. We are relationally placing ourselves in the hands of others, and that explains why so many people refuse to communicate, share, or share deeply because I put myself in your hands. I'm in danger. So what I want you to do is begin to look at that. And begin the perspectives of that, deal with that, interact with it. Work through it. See people. Be careful how you respond. Instead of just taking it for granted. Now that means, one more thing and I'm done, you have to be fully present. Now most of us are not fully present because we're in such pain ourselves. And it's easy to get overwhelmed. And like, like a couple Sundays ago, it's easy for church people to get bugged that I'm, I'm not fully present. I didn't even hear what you said. How, how, how are you? Oh, I'm not too good, but praise the Lord. <laughs> Don't praise the Lord. I didn't say I was good. Well, it's just, it's just salutation. I'm not looking to interact with you. All I want to do is just get you to speak back. Now you spoke back. I'm done. Don't tell me no other stuff. But if I'm fully present, there is a healing that can go forth in our communication. Amen? Amen? Come on, let's pray about it. Father, thank you that you love us enough to always hear us mm. and to respond in love. May we have the same kind of listening skills and heart with you. Uh, would you take this sermon and put it down inside, let the truth be engrafted inside of us. It's not enough for us to just hear these things and say amen and do a little shouting about them. We need to live them out, Lord. And so, Lord, help us to do that, to live them out. I want to thank you that there have been people in this church that have listened to me, heard me with their heart, and responded in love, that have brought healing into my life. And I hope that I've done that for some others, Lord. But let it be something that grows in the community. 
that folks will want to be a part because of the healing nature of that that takes place. What a mighty God you are. We're, we thank, we're thankful for all that you do. Lord, protect us from the coronavirus. Uh, we're, we're, we want to put our eggs in the uh, quarantine basket, but I'm going to put mine in the Holy Ghost basket. <laughs> I, I hope that quarantine works, but when it doesn't, raise up a standard against the disease and keep us safe from the pestilence that stalks the night. Watch over us, Lord. And then even if we would contract the virus, you are a healer that can bring healing and we say thank you. Praise these things in Jesus' name. Amen. God is good.